Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started here today. Thank you so much for joining our live webinar. For today's discussion, we are taking inspiration from the change in seasons that we have coming up here uh, that parents and students are well aware of, and that is the back to school season. So my name is Lauren Morellis, and I am one of three presenters for today's webinar. I am joined by my teammates, Yusuf Abujadari and Lauren Stansel. And for the next hour or so, we are going to be sharing strategies for scholastic success that everyone from new parents just starting the journey of education planning for their children to empty nesters who have sent their kids off to college and everyone in between can employ and use and take advantage of and, and be mindful of. Before we begin, I want to share one quick housekeeping note. On your screen, you should see a toolbar like the one shown here on this slide. And there's two areas on this toolbar that I want to draw your attention to. The first is the raise the hand button. So just like you're back in school, um, you can click on that button to get our attention, uh, to ask a question or get help. And if we see your hand up, we can also unmute your line so that you can engage in a dialogue with us if you so desire, um, or just go ahead and type in a question there. The second item to note is the questions and chat box, which is at the bottom of that screen. And we hope you'll use this to send us any questions or comments or feedback. Um, you can simply type your message in the white box and click that send button, and we'll be able to see your comments and questions. So we encourage you to feel free to use these tools to connect with us, and we look forward to hearing from you. So with that note aside, we want to dive into our discussion. When we think about the back to school season and how that intersects with our expertise as financial planners, a number of different topics come to mind. The most obvious might be saving for college. Along those same lines is thinking about the best investments for those college saving accounts. We also have experience with talking to kids about money with our financial literacy program and then continuing those conversations with more sophisticated and age relevant topics like budgeting. As time passes, we become a helpful resource for those starting the transition to college when financial aid and FAFSA become important. And then again, when it comes to figuring out how to pay off those student debt. And finally, whether it be because you are an empty nester with more time on your hands or because you simply feel inspired by the back to school season, organizing your financial life can be another important part of the back to school season that we can share some insights on. So our plan for today is to briefly touch on all of these topics and we're going to do so in a way that we hope you will find engaging and relatable. And that is by sharing our insights on common questions related to each of these topics. So we're going to explore a set of predetermined questions that we have received in the past. Um, but as I mentioned a few moments ago, we encourage our live audience to submit whatever questions are on your mind as well um, throughout this presentation. So without further ado, let's take a look at our first question. We'll start at the very beginning of the education planning journey. So this question here is, my spouse and I would like to open a savings account for our son's college expenses. What's the best kind of account to open? I'm going to pass it off to you. I'm sure you've been asked this question before. Can you share your thoughts with us? I can. And what's funny is this is a question that my spouse asked me recently. Uh, as many of you know, we welcomed our son into the world some eight months ago uh, and had to go through this process ourselves, determining the best kinds of accounts uh, to open for him. Um, today's conversation is going to focus on the three different accounts we see used most prevalently, uh, which are 529 plans described on this slide and the subsequent two slides uh, are going to detail some information about educational savings accounts and custodial accounts. And what we'll do is kind of do a bit of a compare and contrast amongst the three different accounts, uh, talk about some of their features and things to be aware of uh, when choosing to use these for the education savings goal. So starting with 529s, um, starting with the features column here, they 
use, they rather, they receive tax beneficial treatment or beneficial tax treatment, I should say, meaning earnings in those accounts on top of the amounts contributed grow on a tax deferred basis. When distributions are made for qualified expenses, which include tuition, fees, books, supplies, computers, room and board expenses, and special needs equipment. Um, when distributions are made for those qualified expenses, uh, they are tax-free. Another feature to be aware of is that the beneficiary of a 529 plan can be changed. So if, for example, let's just use uh, Megan and I and our son Noah as an example, let's say we have another child, uh, and Noah determines that he's not going to college or, better yet, uh, gets a full scholarship. Uh, in the event that the savings that we've put together for him and his 529 plan are not needed for his college expenses, we can change the beneficiary to our other child, or let's say we don't have another child and Noah still does not need his 529 savings. If I were to return to school or Megan was to go back to school or someone else in our family, we could change the beneficiary to one of those individuals. Um, so it's a very flexible approach to making sure that the benefit of those tax deferred earnings and tax-free withdrawals uh, is capitalized upon uh, in the event that the original beneficiary does not need to access those funds. The next two bullets on the slide are best illustrated um, in a conversation comparing against an account that does have those age restrictions or time restrictions or income restrictions. So you'll hear me reference those on the next slide. Uh, so we'll come back to those in a moment. And with respect to completing the FAFSA, um, it's just important to note that 529s are counted as an asset of the parent uh, when that application is being completed. As far as things to be aware of, um, it's important to note that there is a 10% penalty assessed on the earnings for a distribution that's used for a non-qualified expense. So as a quick example to illustrate what we mean, if $100 have been contributed to a 529, and then $10 of earnings appreciation on that initial $100 contribution were to occur, and then a full withdrawal was made of the entire balance of $110 for a non-qualified expense, the 10% penalty would be assessed only on the $10 of earnings above and beyond the contribution. And so, because the math is easy here, the penalty would be a dollar. And that's just to point out how the penalty works if the distribution is made for a non-qualified expense. Uh, and then lastly, a point about the contributions being treated as completed gifts. Uh, this is important to note if anyone is making a contribution to the 529 plan that's going to exceed the annual exclusion amount. The exclusion amount for 2018 is $15,000. And so any individual, whether it's a parent, relative, friend, uh, can make a gift of up to $15,000 to a 529 without having to worry about gift tax. Um, if a contribution is going to be made in excess of that amount, um, that works. Uh, it's important to, to check the specific rules of each state's 529 plan as um, there may be uh, planning things or things to, to think about from a planning perspective uh, regarding a contribution of that magnitude. Um, but it's not until the gift exceeds that amount uh, that gift tax issues come into play. Um, and if a contribution of that amount is going to be made, consult your financial planner uh, just to ensure that gift tax issues are being planned for appropriately. The next account we'll talk about, or type of account rather, are education savings accounts. Uh, and again, we'll go through the features all of the features you see here match those on the previous slide. So again, tax deferred earnings, tax free withdrawals for qualified expenses. Um, the beneficiary can be changed again to another member of the beneficiary's family. Uh, and the balance of the account is counted as an asset of the parent uh, when completing the FAFSA and, and doing applications for financial aid. With respect to things to be aware of, again, the same 10% penalty comes into play on earnings. Uh, contributions are treated as completed gifts as we in the, in the manner that we just described. However, here are some of the things that are different about educational savings accounts relative to 529 plans. 
Number one, annual contributions are limited to $2,000 per beneficiary per year from all sources. So you're never going to run into the annual exclusion issue if the only account being used for a beneficiary is an educational savings account. You'll never get close to that $15,000 limit. However, if there's an educational savings account and another account being used for the child uh, in, in building up their, their savings for their college expenses, then some coordination may need to be done to ensure that the annual gift exclusion amount uh, is not exceeded uh, by any individual making contributions to the accounts uh, for the child's benefit. There is an income threshold for contributions made to an education savings account. So if a single individual earns more than $110,000 or uh, joint filers are earning more than $220,000, then they're ineligible to make a contribution to this account. So that's a thing to be aware of. Uh, and then lastly, and this is related back to the point that I mentioned I would cover on this slide, uh, in contrast to how 529s work, for education savings accounts, there are restrictions regarding contributions. Uh, they must cease before the beneficiary reaches age 18. So before the, the child reaches age 18, contributions can be made to the account. After their 18th birthday, contributions must stop. And then the balance of the account must be exhausted before the beneficiary reaches age 30. Uh, so there's a timer in effect that goes into place uh, once they reach age eight. Once they reach age 18, uh, the balance of the account must be used by the time they reach age 30. And then lastly, we'll, we'll do a brief discussion about custodial accounts, their features, and some things to be aware of if they're used uh, for this goal. Number one, there are no income restrictions. Uh, so anyone earning any amount can make a contribution to a custodial account for the benefit of the minor. Um, and it's important to note, and this you know, is a bit obvious, but we should just specify that distributions can be used for any reason without penalty, but must be used for the benefit of the minor, the named beneficiary of the account. Uh, things to be aware of, the taxability of the earnings and the gains for these types of accounts. Um, there is no tax deferred benefit and certainly no tax free distribution here. Uh, the earnings are taxable and the gains are taxable to the minor. Um, you may have heard of the kitty tax. Uh, there have been changes to the kitty tax based on uh, the new provisions under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, that was put into place this year. Going forward in 2018 and beyond, the kitty tax will be based on tax rates assessed against trusts. Previously, uh, unearned income above the $2,100 threshold uh, was taxed to the child, but at the parent's tax rate. So with that change uh, in the rules, we recommend engaging a financial planner and consulting with them about all the tax planning issues uh, regarding uh, the use of a custodial account, and then certainly, of course, consulting with the CPA as well. Another thing to note here that's different regarding custodial accounts relative to the two other accounts we discussed is that you cannot change the beneficiary. Uh, furthermore, another difference as related to the other accounts that we discussed, these assets are counted as the student's asset when completing a financial aid application. Um, a similarity is that contributions are, of course, treated as completed gifts, uh, just as we described uh, related to the two other accounts. The main thing that we discuss with parents who are interested in opening custodial accounts, aside from the other planning things that we've mentioned here, is the notion of control. When the minor reaches the age of majority, which depends on the state in which you live, um, it's either 18 or 21 in most cases, um, at that point they gain total control over whatever the balance of the account is. So if it's $10,000 or $100,000 or some other balance, at that age the account converts into an individual brokerage account in their name and there are no restrictions uh, for how, that, how those funds can be used. So it's not, we're not passing a judgment on, on that as to whether or not that's a good idea or a bad idea. It's certainly uh, a consideration that needs to be planned for and, and discussed, uh, both, we think, with your financial planner and then also with uh, the beneficiary, ultimately, when the time is right. Um, 
and that concludes uh, the comments on those accounts. Excellent. Thank you. Very informative. Appreciate that. So our next question is one that I feel is a natural follow-up to our first one. Okay, now that I've got an account open to save money, how do I invest it? Lauren, can you share your thoughts on this one? Absolutely. So we'll start off with a pretty broad-ranging answer um, on how to invest, and that would be globally and very broadly diversified, just like any other account that we manage or advise on. Uh, we think it's really important to be globally invested and to be very broadly diversified. And so when investing education accounts, there are two phases that we think of, and we have policies and approaches to each of these phases that are different for different reasons. The first phase is the accumulation phase, and this is while you're actually saving to this account. So you are actively saving money to this education account and you're accumulating funds for your beneficiary's future educational needs. The second phase is the spending phase, and this is when the beneficiary is actually needing to use those funds for those qualified education expenses. And as we'll see in the coming slides, there are different policies and different investment approaches that we use during each of these phases according to uh, the growth needs and the stability needs of the investments at that time. And one of the things that I've noted is that we use policies. And so, you know, we, we believe that policy-based financial planning can be extremely powerful in really every aspect of planning. And so we'll talk about some policies with the accumulation phase here in front of us, as well as the spending phase. But we also use policy-based financial planning when it comes to everything from cash flow to charitable giving, to helping children with gifting later in their adult lives. Uh, there are kind of three topics we'll, we'll touch on policies later in this presentation as well. Uh, we'll talk about budgeting, as a policies around budgeting, policies for young working adults, and policies for student debt. Um, so you'll see those policies come up a lot in this presentation and in a lot of different topics that we often cover in our financial planning relationships. So the policies you see in front of you are for the accumulation phase. Again, that's while you're actually saving funds for the beneficiary to that education account. And one of our policies is that we want to use qualified plans like 529s to take advantage of those tax benefits that Yusuf was just sharing with us. And in general, we recommend targeting about half of the expected tuition expenses as the savings goal in those qualified plans. An additional savings for the other half of the expected tuition expenses we believe should occur in taxable accounts. Uh, so an individual or joint account in your name or you're in your spouse's name. And the main reason behind those policies is to preserve your flexibility. So Yusuf touched on a point earlier, you know, Noah is absolutely adorable and we might have dreams that he will also go to Virginia Tech one day, but it's hard to know if that's actually going to be the case. So preserving the flexibility in case he decides not to go to a four-year school or use those funds for qualified education expenses in the future will allow Yusuf and Megan or anyone in this situation to have flexibility and, and divert some of those funds to other needs if they're not needed for education. Another policy is that just like we do in the accumulation and spending phases of normal savings, uh, we want to adjust the investments over time. So as the student approaches college age, we want to reduce the exposure to stocks and increase the exposure to bonds to become more conservative as the funds are getting closer to being actually spent. And regardless of the amount accumulated in preparation for these education expenses, we still want we still recommend applying for grants and scholarships to preserve those savings. Uh, if the student has specific qualities or skills that would allow them to apply for scholarships and qualify for those scholarships, it's a great idea to still apply for those. And if, if the scholarships cover some of the, some of the expenses, then we don't need to use all of the savings accumulated. So to go a little deeper into some of those, the investment policies we have, different phases or different age brackets throughout the accumulation phase. The first bracket is when the beneficiary is between the ages of zero and six. And at this time, the beneficiary's time horizon for these investments is a very long time before the funds will be needed. And so when we have a long time horizon, it makes sense to be more aggressive with our investments. So our policy 
for educa all education accounts is that from ages zero to six, the funds are invested 100% in stocks and 0% in bonds. Our next age bracket is from seven to 12. So we're getting a little bit closer to college age, but not quite there yet. Still have a lot of time that we wanna grow the funds. And so for our education accounts between ages seven and 12, our allocation shifts to 90% stocks and 10% bonds. Next, from 13 to 15, again, we're getting closer and closer, and so over time, we're shifting out a little bit out of stocks and more into those bonds. So we shift to an 80% stock and 20% bond allocation. And then the final age bracket during the accumulation phase would be from ages 16 to 18. So these are the last couple years before this beneficiary reaches college age. And at this time, we shift to 70% stocks and 30% bonds. And to show you an example, one of the one of the investment vehicles that we use is Utah's 529 plan, which is called My 529. And so when, when you don't have a specific uh, state-related tax benefit to saving to your state's own 529 plan, we recommend the Utah 529 plan. And um, one of the reasons you may see on the screen in front of you is that the Utah 529 plan offers us dimensional fund advisors or DFA funds that we like, and it allows us to build really a portfolio that almost identically aligns with the portfolios that we build and manage directly at Schwab. And you'll notice here, this is an actual screenshot from setting up um, a My529 account, and there are age brackets that perfectly align with our policies. So from zero to six, we have 100% in stocks and 0% in bonds. Then seven to 12, 90, 10. From thir age 13 to 50, we have 80% in stocks, 20% in bonds. And then from 16 to 18, we have 70% in stocks and 30% in bonds. So over time, the investments shift as the student approaches actual college age. And then it's time to enter the spending phase. This is when funds are actually needed to pay those tuition expenses, books, computers, all of the qualified education expenses that Yusuf shared with us. And we have another or new set of policies for those investments during the spending phase. And those policies are the current year's needs are kept in cash. That aligns directly with our internal cash needs policy for all accounts. Any known expenses coming in the next 12 months should be kept in cash. Beyond that, cash needs for the remaining years of school are kept in bonds. So for example, if a beneficiary student is entering their first year of a four-year college education, they would have one year's worth of tuition and all of their expense, expenses kept in cash, and they would have the remaining three years kept in bonds. And to the extent that there are excess funds in the account above those amounts, those amounts are invested in stocks because they're assumed to be needed for future expenses and can continue growing. As that cash is spent on those qualified education expenses, it would be topped up from the bonds and some of the funds in the stocks shifted into bonds if needed uh, to maintain these balances to make sure we've always got the current year needs kept in cash and the remaining needs in bonds. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Lauren. That was great. So switching gears a bit from in accounts and investments, our next question is related to financial literacy. The question we have posed here is, I'm not sure where to begin when it comes to teaching my child about money. There's so much material out there, and I'm struggling to differentiate between useful resources and junk. Can you help me? And if you don't mind learning Yusuf, I'd like to jump in on this one first, um, because as some, as some of you may recall, earlier this year, we hosted a webinar on the topic of financial literacy. And during that webinar, I shared a bit about our financial literacy program. And I think it'd be great to briefly summarize our program here again today. So our financial literacy program includes six resources that we share with friends, family, and other loved ones. Um, who are important to our clients. 
And the pro program begins with our Money Savvy Pig, our Cash Cash, and the a official money guide for teenagers. And all of these tools introduce the concepts of saving, spending, donating, and investing. Um, and they do so in a way that is appropriate for various age groups. As you can see here, it spans from three years to 13 years old. And these tools each come with additional worksheets and booklets and a variety of things that can act as really natural conversation starters for parents, which is helpful to get those tough conversations started, but all while still maintaining the fun for, um, for the kids. The next two books are What Color Is Your Parachute? and Where Will You Be Five Years From Today? And these books encourage teens to explore their passions, to pursue their lived big lives, if you will, as we like to say. Um, and both of these resources include questions that are meant to inspire the teens' creativity and help them find their passions. Um, and they also provide ample opportunity for parents and children to have those more sophisticated financial and life conversations. So we think they're can be pretty helpful tools for, for starting those conversations. And finally, we recommend and send to college graduates, Generation Earn. Um, and I always like to point out the subtitle of this book is The Young Professional's Guide to Spending, Saving, and Giving Back. And I just love that. It comes full circle back to um, the Money Savvy Pig reemphasizing the concepts that, that the kids have been exploring since they received the Money Savvy Pig. Um, so these are just a few examples of helpful resources for starting those tough conversations with your kids. Um, is there anything that you would like to add, Yusuf or Lauren, to, about the financial literacy program? Yeah, Lauren, I'll go ahead and jump in here and just note that specifically with respect to the what color is your parachute and then subsequent gifts that we send as part of the financial literacy program, those transition points present great opportunities for children to connect with us and start developing their relationship uh, with their financial planner. Um, you know, high school juniors in many cases are getting their first job, whether it's something as uh, simple as mowing lawns in the neighborhood or actual W-2 income from a, a part-time job that they're doing. Um, and so that can present a, an opportunity to start having discussions around budgeting and, and so on. Uh, obviously, high school graduates are going off to college in many cases, and so some of the stuff that we're talking about in today's presentation could be a good thing for us to go over with the um, child. And then obviously college graduates are hopefully entering the workforce uh, if they're foregoing any uh, further schooling. And it's at that point that the financial planning engagement becomes paramount uh, in, in, in folks' lives. So we think of those as great opportunities to start good conversations with us too. Perfect, great. I appreciate it. Yeah, good, great additional insights and something that you mentioned in there. Um, I'm going to pull out because it, it connects well with our next topic here, budgeting. Um, so this question makes me laugh. When I try to talk about talk to my kids about budgeting, it seems that they have carrots in their ears. What suggestions or resources do you recommend for having these conversations? And Lauren, I'd like to turn it back over to you. What do you think about this topic of budgeting? Great. Yeah, budgeting is extremely important. I think Lauren and Yusuf, you both just made really great points about this financial literacy program we have and really the goal of getting these, getting children, your children or your grandchildren or anyone that you want involved, starting to think about what it's like to budget and what it's like to manage your own funds and have income and have expenses that you're being going to be paid. And so one of the first things that I'll come back to are policies. And so there are some great policies around cash flow and budgeting that we like to share. And so this is an image of a bookmark that we send with some of those financial literacy books. And so on the front is the, top, the picture in the top left is just a wordle about all sorts of different words that come into play when you're thinking about budgeting and, and becoming a young working adult. And then on the back of the bookmark, we have these policies here. And we think that these apply to every young working adult. And so that could be someone getting their first job in high school, mowing lawns or working at a retail store. That could be someone in college who is working while in college or after college starting their career. And so one of the first policies here is to save 10% of every paycheck you ever earn towards retirement. 
and we'll go into a little bit more detail on, you know, where that might be saved. Um, having health and disability insurance when you're working is really important and ensuring your belongings, especially if you're not living at home and you are renting, making sure that you have renter's insurance and your belongings are covered. And one of the ones here is track your spending and follow a budget. And so we will dive into a little bit more about budgeting. So when we think about budgeting, there are two categories and really there's income and expenses. And so the first thing to think about is your sources of income or your resources. So if you're working while you're in school, you will, be ha you will have income coming in. You, the student may also have parental assistance, par parents helping them out, paying their expenses, uh, or student loans. While not necessarily quote unquote income, they are resources that you can use to pay your expenses. And the next step is to plan for those expenses. Think through all of the various expenses you have, the resources you have, and create a budget that will work for you, and then actually stick to it. And so one of the things about resources is also knowing what you have available to you or what your situation looks like. So if you have a meal plan, you're living on campus or off campus, and you have a meal plan for dining while you're in college, it makes sense to take advantage of that meal plan versus spending excess money to go dine out at Taco Bell or Pizza Hut for every meal. If you're working, like we just talked about, save money. It's a really good habit to build as soon as the student starts working, uh, you know, 10% of your income. So that could be if you're just mowing lawns or if you're working uh, retail or at a restaurant, that could be saving 10% to a Roth IRA. And a Roth IRA is really great, provided that you qualify, because it allows tax-free growth forever. If you're working uh, as a W-2 employee and you're making a salary, your employer might have, should hopefully have a retirement plan. And so you can save 10% to that. And it's something that you can, it's really wise to use as a policy. You know, that is policy number one. I save 10% of everything I earn. And then you just get in the habit and it becomes second nature. And one of the things you can do is you can also make it automatic. So if you're working and you have an employer retirement plan, they take automatic contributions to that retirement plan out of your paycheck and you never even see the money. So you don't have to make a decision, oh, am I going to save my 10% this paycheck or am I going to spend it on something fun? Um, if, it's to, if you're saving to a Roth IRA, you can set up automatic contributions from your checking account to your Roth IRA. And so these, it's a really good habit to build. So as I mentioned for budgeting, we start with income. And on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see our kind of cash flow projection template. So we start with the inflows, and you might have various inflows. You might have some parental assistance. You might have student loans that you are taking out each semester or each school year. You may have some income from working. So you would fill in your various sources of income, and that gives you all of your resources that you can use on a monthly or annual basis. And then you go through the expenses. And you'll see here we have the expenses broken out into two categories, fixed expenses and discretionary expenses. And so fixed expenses are those things that are required to be paid each period. So it may be your rent is required to be paid each month or your utility bills are required to be paid if you want the electricity to stay on. You may have other loan payments. You may have car insurance that you're paying. You, of course, will have your tuition and your room and board and your various education expenses that you'll be required to pay to stay in school. And then you have your discretionary expenses. And discretionary expenses are paid only if you really choose to do or buy something. And so this might be um, allocations to dining out a couple times a month. It might be saving for a future vacation. It might be things like uh, making sure that you can take care of yourself in terms of doing your laundry or getting your hair cut. Uh, it might be funds to go shopping with or to donate to charity. And some of the things that come into play when we talk about budgeting are some of those policies. So one policy is to set aside an emergency fund. And when you first start working, we think that emergency fund can be two to three months worth of your income. And so that should be something that you're filling up immediately. You want to save towards that first. And then once that bucket for your emergency fund is full, 
then you might start saving your 10% of everything you earn for future needs, like upcoming large expenses. If you want to buy a new gadget and you know that you want to do that in the next 3, 6, 12 months, if you know you're going to go on a vacation next year, start setting, a, setting aside funds each month towards that expense so that you know you're building up that bucket so that you have the funds and resources available when, it's, when those funds are needed. Great stuff, Lauren. Thank you. Very good. Um, so we're going to switch gears again, and let's talk about what happens when parents are getting ready to use those funds that they've been saving as their kids begin to transition from high school and start thinking about college. Um, and I'll note that we, we have a question that came in um, from, from our audience that I think is going to um, be addressed here. Um, so just kind of showing that it, it really is a common question that is asked. Um, and so this, this question really just sounds all too familiar to me. I realize it's an acronym, but I can barely spell FAFSA, and it's kind of hard to say, too. How do we know if we qualify for financial, for financial aid? And what about scholarships? Um, Lauren, do you, have, um, do you have some thoughts that you could share with us about FAFSA and financial aid? I do. I'd be happy to share. So the FAFSA is a report that has to be filed uh, in order to determine if, if the student qualifies for financial aid. It's usually also required when applying for any sort of grant or scholarship. And so there have been some changes made to filing the FAFSA. In the past, there was a different window. So in the past, for the 2015 and 2016 school years, you could file the FAFSA starting January of that year through June of the following year. And one of the things that was required in the prior setup was that when you were filing this FAFSA, you had to use, you had to estimate your taxable income information for the coming year. So you would file the FAFSA, estimate your taxable income information, and then you'd have to go back and actually update the FAFSA when your, when your tax year was complete. And so two changes have been made, uh, along with others, but two that I'm going to cover here. The first one is that the filing window or the filing period has been extended a few months. So you'll note here for the 2018 school year, parents could file the FAFSA as early as October 1 of 2017, and they can file it as late as June 30th of 2019. And this will be using their 2016 income tax year information. So this is using prior tax year information that is set in stone, has been the tax return has been filed, and it doesn't require any estimates or going back in to update numbers uh, once final numbers are known. And so we have some resources that we wanted to point out here for you. We didn't want to get into too, too deep into the weeds around the FAFSA, but we do have some really great resources should you have additional questions or want to read more. The first one is an article titled Forthcoming Adjustments to Facilitate Student Advantages, and you'll notice that the acronym there is FAFSA. And this is a great article we wrote about details on those changes made to filing the FAFSA. So the two changes I just covered with the filing period and the tax year information used along with others. The second article on our website is called File On, and it includes details on the deadlines and the actual information required to be used on your FAFSA. And so it allows you really to kind of prepare, to sit down, have all of the resources you need available to you so that you can file the FAFSA in one sitting. A third article is called A Jewel of Financial Tools. And this is a really great one because it shares a lot of different financial tools. And there is one specific section on actually paying for college and has some information there for you on those qualified expenses, grants, and scholarships. And this last piece, I think, directly answers the question we got from the audience, which was, do you have any recommendations on where to look for scholarships or grants to apply for? And there are experts out there who can help you navigate this entire process, everything from filing the FAFSA to how to even think about financial aid, uh, learning what student loans you, you may or may not qualify for, grants that are available, and scholarships that are out there. And so this, these experts are 
really well versed in a lot of schools, but also in doing very in-depth research on any school you may be interested in learning about. So we actually did an expert spotlight on one of these resources, and his name is Tony Sutphin, and his company is Say Yes to College. And so Tony is a really wonderful resource. If you're feeling a little bit lost on all of the financial aid, scholarships, and grants pieces, he will sit down, have conversations, uh, learn a little bit about your school. If he's not familiar, do the research to learn all of the specifics of that school and help you through the entire financial aid process. Similarly, I think, you know, obviously this comes a little bit before actually paying for college is for the student to determine where to apply, how to apply, when to apply. It can be a bit daunting. And so some of our recommendations are first and foremost, do research. Do some soul searching, figure out what characteristics you're really interested in for your college experience or whatever your higher education experience is, whether it's a four-year university, will you be living on campus the whole time, a commuter, a commuter set up to a local school, and think about your characteristics, what you want in terms of location, price, what type of degree you're seeking or what type of education you're hoping to get out of your college experience the layout of the campus if you will be living on campus or the commute if you will be commuting, the community aspects, sports, arts, cultural experiences. You know, some people may want a school with a very big sports atmosphere, a big football team or basketball team or lacrosse team. And some students may not want that as an aspect of their university or college experience. They may want a more intimate setting, a smaller school, and then I think my biggest recommendation is if it's possible, go visit campus. I think it's really important to see where you might be spending the next four years of your life. Uh, you know, pers a pers as a personal aside, I was pretty much set on going to one school and I went to visit Virginia Tech and within moments completely changed my mind and knew exactly where I was meant to be. So I think visiting campus is really helpful and it also allows you to Envision yourself there and meet students who are there in the moment if you have questions for them. And similarly, there are resources that you can use. If desired or feasible for you or for your student, you can consider working with a college counselor. And college counselors are much like career counselors. They will meet the potential or prospective student. They often do some interview style meetings. Uh, sometimes some surveys and experiences to do aptitude tests or interest tests for style of education and career. And then they help do research to determine a school or a program that might best fit the needs and desires of that student. And then also can assist in that application process. They have a lot of experience with applications to various schools and can help with deadlines for those applications, helping with any sort of essays or interviews the student might need to do. So it can be another really great resource before you actually get to the financial aid piece of just figuring out where the student may be interested in going to school. Awesome. And one thing I want to add, Lauren, something you said um, just about do, do some soul searching. I think it's really important. And I also think that the book, um, where, do you, where Do You Want to Be Five Years From Today or Where Will You Be Five Years From Today, um, offers some questions that help you just start thinking about these things. Um, something like layout, I think that's something that's overlooked oftentimes. So I think that was, that was great. So thanks for those things. So, of course, with the ever-growing cost of a college education, it's possible that even the best education planning efforts um, still result in graduates leaving college with student loan debt, um, which leaves them reaching out with questions like this one. Hello, 911, I'm drowning in student debt. Please send help directly to my checking account. This is so funny, makes me laugh. Um, Yusuf, I'd love to hear from you on this one. What would you suggest for someone feeling this way? So let's tab to the next slide and we'll have a bit of a conversation regarding our policies and recommendation for approaching paying down debt. Um, Lauren mentioned that we use policy-based financial planning in so many areas uh, of a client's life. Um, one of them being uh, debt service. And so before we get into this graphic and talk about how these policies work, 
uh, I want to discuss a couple of assumptions that are made um, or embedded rather in, in this image. So first off, what we're assuming is that all minimum obligations are being made for all debt. If there are two or three different obligations and each has a minimum requirement, those minimum requirements are being met on whichever schedule um, you know, is, is required. Above and beyond that, then, at the point at which the graduate's income allows for uh, additional payments being made, and there's a question as to how to best allocate those resources so that their student debt is being paid down in the most productive way, this graphic is a helpful tool to organize your thought process around how to do that. Lauren also mentioned in her discussion around budgets this notion of bucketing and thinking about different obligations as different buckets. The graphic that you're looking at, obviously there are the two inflows of funds coming either from normal income or intermittent income, windfalls, bonuses, um, inheritances, things of that nature. The way we've structured the payment of debt is based on paying down the debt with the highest associated cost. So if an individual has three obligations and one carries a 10% interest rate and the other two carry interest rates of 8% and 6%. We believe that surplus cash flow above and beyond the minimum obligations for the various, um, the minimum, minimum requirements for the various obligations should be directed at the loan with the highest interest rate. Get that balance down so that the interest costs are mitigated. Once that, came, that loan obligation is either satisfied or the goal or threshold for additional payments to that loan is satisfied, then the bucket tips and the interest, or rather the loan with the next highest interest rate should be the one that receives additional payments above and beyond the minimum obligation. And then so you can see, of course, how the, the buckets cascade from the first to the second and third and so on. And so we'll spend just a moment talking about what we're trying to, to communicate on the left side of the graphic. Intermittent income comes in um, you know, throughout the year. From behavioral finance standpoint, it can be really powerful for the student to experience this feeling of a win. Uh, and so if 10% of any windfall is immediately allocated towards the debt with the smallest balance, irrespective of its interest rate, just seeing that uh, significant nominal reduction in debt on that specific obligation can feel like a huge win and is a huge win that should be celebrated. Uh, and so we are using some of the, of the notions that we've come across in our research regarding behavioral finance and behavioral economics to note that as important as it is to pursue the best financial solution, sometimes an emotional win uh, can also be important when it comes to meeting someone's financial planning goals. And so knocking out the smallest balances uh, with intermittent income can serve to achieve that goal. Lastly, uh, a point to make about uh, just the notion of overwhelming debt. If a student's level of income does not allow for them to meet the minimum obligations for, or the minimum requirements for the various debt obligations, we recommend consulting your financial planner to discuss other options, whether it's consolidation or refinancing. Um, engage someone like us and determine what the best options for your specific situation is and then proceed from there. Perfect. Great. Very helpful. So we've come up here on our last question, last but not least. And this one relates to getting organized. So as I have alluded to earlier in this presentation, there may be a variety of reasons that people feel inspired by the back to school season to re refocus their energy and take the time to get their financial life organized. Um, I think it feels good to finish the year organized, or um, it might have even been one of your New Year's resolutions that you want to get working on before year end. And so the question that we've listed here is such. With the kids back in school, I have a lot more time on my hands. I know we have a ton of should do, but we're having a hard time getting organized. Where should we start? 
And I would like to take the first shot at this one again, guys, um, because I've actually been reading a lot of articles um, on the topic, on this topic uh, recently. And as my teammates would tell you, I, I love organizing. So um, what I'll share about organizing your financial life is this. Think about getting organized as if you are assembling a first aid kit for your financial life. And any good first aid kit contains everything you could possibly need to make sure that you are fully prepared to easily access any of your important financial documents, of course, if or when they are needed. So when assembling this kit, what should it include? Here's a, a few examples of the different kinds of records you should keep in mind. Records related to personal financial management. So this includes credit card statements, student loan statements that we were just talking about, mortgage information, bank account statements, things of that nature. Investment statements. Think about keeping handy your brokerage account statements, retirement account statements, stock certificates, things of that nature. Uh, your estate documents. These are pretty straightforward. Your wills, trusts powers of attorneys, advanced medical directives, all those really important uh, important documents to have on hand um, in case something happens. Legal documents, of course, so birth certificates, social, social security cards, passports, your marriage certificate, divorce degrees, all of those things um, important to keep handy um, in, in case of need. Home documents include appraisal documents, deeds, anything, any renovation receipts so that you could um, prove things if needed, um, and a list, um, a list of things or photos or videos of your home contents. Um, you might underestimate how much stuff you actually have, so having photos and videos of it can be really helpful. Your income tax information, that is your tax returns, charitable gift documentation, property tax information. Uh, medical information includes who's your primary care physician, how do you contact them, any other medical specialists that you use, important medical documentation, um, insurance cards. And then again, related to insurance, the original policies um, and recent statements for your homeowner policies, auto policies, umbrella, life, disability, long-term care, all of, those, all of those things that you've put in place to insure yourself. You want to make sure that you have those handy, um, which is the next point. So, of course, you have all of this information and storing your financial aid, financial first aid kit um, is just as important to as it is to stocking it. Um, so, one of the best practices we feel is to get a waterproof and fireproof case to store the physical documents that you have just to ensure that they can remain intact in case of any kind of emergency. Um, and you might also consider storing all of these items digitally. And that might be on a USB or safely is a keyword in the cloud um, for easy access um, at any computer. So if you weren't able to get to those physical documents, you could have them. Um, so both of these steps, collecting the documents and safely storing them, I think just overall gives you a peace of mind um, that you are armed with all of your financial information if and when it is needed. So, um, and then finally, I will just add similar to the way that Lauren did, we have a few resources on our website um, where you can find more information on organizing your financial life. So these um, three articles, they all offer a slightly different perspective on the topic. Um, so we encourage you to check them out and, and keep that in mind. As if you find that you have more time on your hands or you just want to make that New Year's resolution complete, um, take a look at these resources. Is there anything else on this one, Lauren and Yusuf, that you would like to like to chime in with? I'd love to chime in, Lauren. I think that was really great. Appreciate you sharing those pieces. The only thing I'd add here is that for a lot of these items in your financial first aid kit, we'd love to have copies on file. Uh, there are a lot of items in here that can relate directly to your financial plan and to allowing us to really make sure that we are aware of your full picture and that every piece of advice or recommendation we're giving you is taking into account all of the various items of your financial first aid kit in addition to your various financial planning items. Uh, you know, specifically, I'll give a couple really quick examples. You, the estate documents, the income tax information, and the insurance documents are really helpful to us in being aware of your setups. 
and then being able to talk to you about those items and make sure that everything is aligned with your wishes and make sure specifically when it comes to the tax return information that we're keeping every every piece of your picture in mind when we're meeting with you and when we're discussing your various scenarios or options or questions. Perfect, yeah, I think that was great, thank you. So that was the end of our planned questions. Um, we answered one live question along the way and we're happy to take any other questions from our audience. Feel free to send us your thoughts in the chat window. While we wait to see if there's any questions, any closing thoughts that you would like to share? Not on my end. Uh, this was a fun presentation to go through and hopefully uh, our audience found it informative. Agreed. And I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, Lauren, but of course, if anyone has any questions after this, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at any point. We'd love to discuss more in detail or your specific situation at any point. Steal away, not a problem. Yeah, just like Lauren said, we're always <laughs> available to answer your questions. Feel free to send us an email, give us a call, schedule a meeting with us. We're happy to, to talk about these things. We like to talk about these things. So um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, we will have a copy of this, uh, a recording, I should say, of this webinar posted on our website within the next 24 hours or so. Um, so with that, we will wrap up our discussion for today. And we want to thank you all for spending time with us. And thank you to Yusuf and Lauren for the great insights that you shared on answering these questions. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. And otherwise, we look forward to talking with you on our next webinar. Thank you for joining us.